Good morning and welcome to day two of Colorado State University's Office of International Programs International Symposium. My name is Kevin Noe and it's my privilege this morning to welcome you to our session, Let's Build a Chair. This session will be led by Jonathan Carlion, Associate Professor of Spanish here at CSU. I would like to remind everyone that down below, the Q&A and chat are both enabled. For this session, we'd like to direct our participants to the chat function, as towards the end of this session, it will become quite collaborative in nature. So please feel free to utilize the chat. Additionally, at the end of this program, there will be a short survey. So if you have time to complete that, we would greatly appreciate it. Finally, closed captioning is available and it will be found at the bottom of your screen. So with that, I turn it over to Jonathan and let's learn how to build a chair. Well, thank you very much. And um, thank you everyone for uh, coming to this panel. Um, I will say it was originally designed kind of as a, a round table conversation and I've updated it for, for Zoom. But the first question is a little bit of a legacy of that uh, original um, plan. And that is just to ask you, um, you know, chairs in a day, you know, to get us started, how many chairs do you sit in over the course of a day? And by some statistics, you could, people have access to either 75 or up to 100 chairs per capita around the world. So this is not an easy question necessarily to answer. Uh, but, you know, we have the kitchen table, uh, obviously. And probably all of us have a favorite chair that we tend to sit at at the table. Um, we also have the office and that's kind of hit or miss. Some of us have really nice office chairs. Others of us, myself included, have kind of a hand-me-down uh, from, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, I've removed the armrests so I can get it under the table a little bit better. Uh, but there's that chair and, and I you know, sit in it every day. And then, you know, the family room, I guess that would be another area where I would sit over the course of the day. Um, now, I'm not including a car because I don't believe it's the same type of thing, although maybe you would include that. And, um, you know, being seated isn't necessarily the same thing as sitting in a chair. Uh, so that's a, a distinction I wanna draw. And, and also point out that for the vast majority of human history, squatting, in fact, was the preferred and comfortable method of sitting. And there's a lot of cultures where squatting still is the preferred and uh, more comfortable method of sitting. But moving on, um, why am I interested in chairs? It, it could be a good question. Um, and it began because I, be, I, I took up word working um, around about a year and a half ago. And it was the first summer of the pandemic and you know everyone was stuck at home. And, I started to, to, to do it because I needed to help my parents with some home improvements that they needed at their house. And they weren't able to, to call anyone out because of the COVID restrictions. So I would, you know, I would, I would build these things at, at my house, bring them over there and, and make sure it worked. Uh, but little by little, I, I started just becoming more and more fascinated by, by woodworking and about what goes into woodworking. Here's a couple of images, one from Spain of, of carpenters uh, working on different, um, you know, trussles and beams and, and joinery. And then another uh, from the uh, Japanese culture that has a very rich culture of, of fine furniture and, and carpentry. And all over the world, you'll find a tremendous amount of examples. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a, an embarrassing, though. This is the first actual uh, woodworking um, experiment I did on my own. And it's just a birdhouse. <laughs> you know, I had to cut the 90 degree angles that you see on the roof. And I had to uh, put a hole into the one piece there to allow the birds to get in and out. And I remember showing this one to my dad. My grandfather was a carpenter. And the only thing he could say is, wow, those 90 degree angles, they're perfect. Uh, so that was kind of fun and it made him happy. But I then, you know, my mom, of course, wanted me to make something for her. So I made this, what they call obelisk to go into uh, her garden. And you know that was kind of fun yeah, with cedar, um, and you know just a little bit of a design element there. Uh, and then the first thing I actually made to help my dad out with for something he was needing was this table. And this was a table that's kind of extra high, so that you could put things on it comfortably. And um, and so you know that was kind of where I went. And 
honestly, those three examples are just a couple of the things I've done, but I fell in love with the craft and I got to know the woodworking community, especially, um, and this was mostly online due to the pandemic. But engagement with this community was a way to learn, to share knowledge, and to share my love of the craft with them and learn from them about their love of the craft. And I am just going to go ahead and throw my um, shyness to the wind here and say I actually uh, put a, a Instagram account so I could talk to all of these people. And I usually over the summer go to Spain for a program called Camino Abroad. But that program was canceled, of course, due to COVID. So I was at home working in Fort Collins and I thought, oh, I'll just call this Camino Works and that way no one will know <laughs> that it's me. Um, of course, that is not the case anymore, but uh, I'd love to have more people following the account. I've met so many wonderful people around the world, um, you know, using this and, 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 and it's just been woodworkers from around the world are amazing. And if you go to that account on Instagram, you know, you'll see I have some tables and I have shelves, I have a Lazy Susan that I made uh, for my mom. Uh, but you know, I've never, at least not yet, made a chair. And chairs are fascinating to me. And they're not easy to make. You know, you have the angles of a chair that they need to fit the body. And, and, and it's not an automatic thing. You know, you have an upright back versus kind of a, a slightly seven degree incl incline on a back. It makes a big difference on the comfort. But, but you know, when you find the right chair, something triggers in our physiology, you know, it feels comfortable. And, you know, going back to my parents, I started all of this to help them out. Um, and in the last months of uh, my, my dad's life, he was going through a very difficult sickness. It became more and more difficult for him to move around the house. And, you know, we had to help him get out of bed, get into the car, get out of the car, get back in the bed. And you know these are cherished memories for me now, but there was one place where I could trust he would be fine and happy and I wouldn't have to worry about him at all. And that was his lazy boy recliner chair. It became kind of like a security blanket for him. And he absolutely loved it. And, you know, and after a while, seeing the chair reminded me of him. And you know, even today I see the chair and, and I'm reminded of him. Um, because there's this relationship between chair and person, and it's more than symbolic, I, I, I would like to, you know, suggest. Uh, one of my favorite artists, the sculpture, uh, you know, uh, named Isabel Miramontes, she's from Spain. And this sculpture by Isabel Miramontes, I think, captures the symbiosis of, of a chair. You see here the legs of the chair and the legs of the human figure uh, whose knees are grasped, are grasped by hands, uh, which transform into the arms of the chair, leading to the back on top of which is found the face of this symbiotic subject. It's an amazing piece. And I can't look at it without thinking of my dad comfortably and safely sitting in his own chair. You know, it's, it's interesting that she's a Spanish artist because you can develop the symbiosis a bit further when we consider the verb um, in Spanish for to be. There are actually two verbs for to be in Spanish, and I'm going to refer to only one of them for now. It's the verb ser, S-E-R, and this verb is used to describe characteristics that are essential uh, to the thing being referred to. For example, one is tall, we would say, es alto. And one is funny, we would say, es chistoso. So ser there is being conjugated as es. Um, but what brings it back to the relationship with a chair is the etymology of the verb ser uh, comes from a Latin verb, sedere, which means quite literally to sit. Uh, sedeo in Latin means I am seated. So I always, you know, I've, I've, I've known this etymology for, for quite a while, but it became more interesting and significant to me when I was preparing for this talk, because, it, you know, what explains that kind of symbiosis between sitting and being? We, we, we can identify with a certain chair, and that, that's our chair, and you know, why, are, why are you sitting in my chair um, type of questions, and these are very common questions, so, you know, we could say that where one is seated speaks directly to who one is. 
And uh, obviously there are many examples in language that, that point to this. We have the cathedral, for example. Um, this is a particular church uh, that belongs to a bishop of a diocese whose chair or cathedra, the Greek word for chair, is the symbolic center of the diocese. You know, we can also think of the university endowed chair. And in Spain, a professor who holds an endowed chair is said to be a catedratico, again, using that Greek word cathedra. Um, one of the most interesting scholars on the topic of chairs, I believe it or not, there are many people who study this, is uh, a professor named uh, Galen, Galen Kranz. Uh, she's now emeritus at, I believe, UCLA. But in her book, The Chair, Rethinking Culture, Body, and Design, she makes the point that, quote, the chair sits and often reveals the person's social status. And as obvious as this may seem when we say it, it, it bears repeating. Because again, you know, at the university, we can think about, you know, department chair, that's, that's a metonym of sorts to describe the person responsible for an academic administration of a unit. But, you know, chairs are, are different and unique all over the world. And it brings me to this international component. So, uh, you know, we see chairs all over the world, but how often do we think of them? You know, maybe we notice them, but do we ever really think of them and what went into making them and the joinery that is needed to keep them from falling apart? Uh, you know, when we lean back in our chair uh, while we're eating dinner, I mean, there's a lot of uh, physics there that the carpenter had to in, intuit in order to make sure that chair wouldn't fall apart. Um, but, you know, inevitably, when people from different cultures meet, there's a moment when they sit down and talk. It's one of the most common things. You know, let's go out for a coffee. So when we look at the chairs, the question of how we explore cultural differences from around the world that are unified by this act of and physiology involved in sitting, uh, these questions become, I think, more, more relevant to conversations and you know, considerations of how we sit, where we sit, with whom we sit. All of these things provide, uh, in my opinion, a point of entry for a, a really interesting and perhaps important discussion on why we sit in the first place. Here we have you know, some different chairs. This is from um, a, a piece by an artist named Matteo. Uh, I have his last name in a slide coming up, so I won't try to, to say it right now. But I just want to point out the diversity of chairs. And then I want to focus on a place for a second, the UN. And most of you know, you know this is in Manhattan on 46th and 1st. And this has been the site of international conversation since 1945. So, you know, I, I think of this every time I think of the chair and, you know, I ask myself, you know, what does the chair look like at the UN? Is, is that something that people even think about? Um, well, here's the artist I was mentioning to you before, Matteo uh, Guarnaccia. And he did this really neat um, piece looking at chairs from different locations around the world. Here he has uh, a couple displaying a chair with no legs. Um, it gets a backdrop of, of navy blue. And that's, you know, that's a really uh, interesting way of looking at, there's a cushion there, it has a nice round back, a um, little bit of space to put your arms up on the side. But then he also points to another chair here in India. Um, and this, it's hard to see perhaps, but there's a little bit of a weave pattern in the, in the seat, kind of um, imitating the rattan style of chairs that you see often in, in India. Um, and then we can go to another one, Nigeria. Uh, again, this is uh, the concept of this art I find very fascinating, but the variety of chairs I also find uh, very fascinating. Uh, so that's Nigeria. Um, and then here we have one from Brazil on, on the beach in uh, what I imagine is Rio de Janeiro. And all these are different chairs, different styles, different reflections of culture, different reflections of international um, you know, variety. And we have this nice little GIF that Matteo put on his website. And I'll just let it cycle through for a moment. Because as you can see, every culture around the world has a chair that they can speak to as if it's their chair. You know, this is, this is what they are identifying at this moment as unique to their culture. But then, you know, we go back to the UN and ask ourselves, well, from this great variety 
what did they choose? And, <laughs> you know, it, it really is striking when you consider that the center of international conversation is also a place where there is no variety in, in, in furniture. You know, the, everyone is kind of put into a location and seated in a specific chair. And I, I took this picture just because I thought, well, this is neat. If we look just at those five countries um, and kind of explore, well, what would the chair look like if we were to actually transform this space and use chairs from the countries of origin? Um, you know, so we have Indonesia and very elegant uh, chair. You can see at the bottom uh, right corner of the screen, uh, woven rattan seats. Um, this looks to be ebonized um, teak or mahogany, perhaps. Um, very beautiful carvings there. Um, no arms, um, but um, it's not. Um, it's a higher seat. Of course, uh, other seats in Indonesia aren't even seats. You have the cushions that are very common um, to to the area for, for reasons of meditation and other. And this is a culture where we're squatting and sitting and, and there's so much variety. It's, it's really fascinating. But then let's go to another place mentioned in, in, that, in that shot. We have Ghana. And if they were to have a seat perhaps of their choice, this uh, tabouré de chef, um, the kind of the, the chief's uh, stand or the chief's stool. Um, this is an Asante wooden stool and it's, in, it's from Ghana, and it's a very traditional uh, seat, and it's kind of interesting. Obviously, most of the weight of the person sitting in the seat is borne by that center column, but it has this decorative circle um, that I don't think does anything necessarily structurally, but it, it does keep it from moving back and forth. I mean, there's a lot of thought going into this design, and the joinery of the design, I would have to look a little bit closely, but I'll say in passing that I'm completely fascinated by joinery, uh, but that's for another conversation. Um, next, you know, we have India. That was another of the locations there in the uh, UN. And we have the Charpai, I think is how you pronounce it. Maybe one of you can correct me later, but the Charpai, uh, which it's kind of the, the cot looking um, structure down at the bottom and in also woven um, yeah, uh, chairs uh, made out of, different uh, materials, perhaps rush, perhaps um, wick, wicker. I'm not quite sure uh, what that is, but these are just variety. And then this is a favorite one. And I think um, one of my colleagues may be on this um, presentation. Uh, and I think I do see him. So he may get a kick out of this. But here we have one from Germany. <laughs> and there's so many chairs in Germany. I'm being really unfair here to focus on uh, these two. One, a very late medieval uh, German chair. Uh, but then we have this one. This was called the torture chair. <laughs> and as you can see, it's uh, a, not a very uh, appetizing place to sit. Um, you have just a bunch of spikes uh, bearing into you and, um, and you're strapped down. So uh, that is the chair that came up very often in my searches for Germany and chair. I would get this uh, torture chair pretty much every time. So uh, just uh, take that one for what it's worth. Now, the last group I want to show you here is the El Salvador um, group, and I'm also going to include Mexico here. And these are two chairs that are really fascinating and that they have kind of um, a, a design quality that goes back to pre um, um, you know, Colombian uh, times to Mesoamerica. We have the Equipal chair down in the right, the lower right column. And then we have a what's called a, a butake up in the upper left column. And I'll talk more about the butake in a moment. But um, you know, if we generalize and talk about Mesoamerican influences, you'll see that there these chairs share quite a bit of the Mayan and the Nahua um, Aztec influence. But now let's go back for a second then to the UN. So, you know, these are the potential chairs that they could have, you know, culturally appropriately um, included. In the, in the hall of the UN. And I ask myself, you know, how different would diversity look if it, they had used these types of chairs? I, I recognize this is kind of a logistics uh, versus a, you know, a, a culture concern. I mean, it's, it's logistically and, and economically very challenging to get all of these chairs into one space. And then you have to, it's a design question that I think would be kind of fascinating to explore. 
but I tried to do a little bit of a Photoshop version of what this might look like. And I will give you a big heads up that this Photoshop is very much, um, you know, a kind of silly almost, but I'm trying to make a point um, by showing you this next image. So please bear with me. Um, if we actually tried to put Germany and Ghana and India and Mexico into the UN, and you know, as, as a cultural representation of the place where they came from, similar to what we saw with um, Matteo Garnaccio, uh, you know, what would that look like? Obviously, this is a little bit of a silly representation of what it would look like, but um, you know, it would look different. And international culture would, would appear different. And our understanding of cultures from around the world would appear different because we would be seeing these cultures kind of in place. And, and that in-placeness, I think, is significant. But, you know, you may think, well, what's the big deal? You know, it's just a chair. Um, but, you know, it is a big deal. And I'll give you one example. In 2013, the, the Japanese uh, design studio, Asahi Sofa, was awarded the UN contract to build chairs for the UN chamber. And it made headlines. You know, this is the Japan Times from 2013. And it quotes the, um, the uh, fine woodworker uh, chairmaker Kasushi Suzuki is quoted as saying, I, I was very proud when I was offered this work. I think it is great that we got a chance to have a fine and sincere example of craftsmanship from Japan that can be seen by so many people. So, you know, chairs matter and, and people actually are interested in chairs. They, they, it's something that is kind of a symbiotic uh, relationship. We, we feel you know, that there's a, there's a reality of our life, perhaps similar to how we, how we sleep every night. We also know we're gonna be sitting. Uh, so there's something very, very intimate there. Um, but this diversity of craftsmanship is not what carried the day in, at the United Nations back in 1945 when it was being founded. Instead, they went for a very beautiful but very specific um, chair. And this was the uh, UN armchair model B37 um, by um, Jakob Kerr. I can't pronounce his name, but this Danish designer was creating this particular model for the United Nations building in New York City. The design was accepted in 1949 and it was actually put into manufacturing in 1957, about you know almost a decade later. But they were using these chairs for quite a while. Um, and you can still find them on the market today and they're in the tens of thousands of dollars. So very much of kind of a modernist Danish design um, chair that, that ruled the day. And here's a couple of other images that go with that. So again, very beautiful chairs, nice um, leather upholstery for the back and for the seat. Um, but you know, the question of this you know, diversity of, of, of world cultures and what that means for conversation and, and should it mean something for conversation. Um, I, I was struck on the UN website, they have this quote from um, one of the architects of the original UN building. And, and this quote, I wanna kind of problematize this quote for, for this group right now. And that is everything will be all right when people stop thinking of the United Nations as a weird Picasso abstraction and see it as a drawing they made themselves. So what's wrong with this quote? You know, maybe nothing, maybe this is just me, but you know, I see this as the challenge or as a major challenge of international multicultural um, you know, conversations. And that is, there is an acknowledgement of all the diversity of chairs, um, you know, is there an acknowledgement, excuse me, of all the diversity of the types of chairs, or do we get used to a certain type of chair and, and have a common denominator? That is to say, do we find common ground through one type of chair that allows us to have a conversation across cultures? Or are we limiting that true conversation by not uh, also including the variety of chairs and the variety of settings in which these conversations take place. So, you know, as I said before, this is a logistics question um, as, much of a, as much as a cultural question. You're not gonna necessarily be able to ship all of these chairs from all over the world and bring them into the UN and have everyone fit into the space. Um, and it's an expense question as well. You know, we have a large hall and 
if any of you have been to Lori Student Center, will know that all the chairs there are the same for the exact same reason. They need to be able to set them up and break them down quickly. Um, but you know, on the other hand, and, and this piece I think is interesting for the context in which we're having this presentation today, the pandemic has opened a window on what this plurality of chairs could look like. You know, we are having more meetings via Zoom, and we can see very often the personal space, these microcultures of the people on the meeting with us. We see a variety of chairs. Right, And it's kind of interesting. We're having these conversations and we're seeing behind the screen into the personal spaces of the people that we're talking to, uh, some of whom sit on sofas, some of whom sit on the side of their bed, some of whom sit in formal chairs. Um, it's, it's, it's striking to see these differences. And, in, and it, maybe it doesn't make a huge difference to the conversation, but maybe it does. That's one of the questions I have for this group um, a little bit later. Um, so, could we do this at scale if we had if we didn't have Zoom? You know, that's another question we'd have to consider as well. But let's say we could do it at scale, and let's try to say, well, what would a chair look like, and what would what could we offer as a suggestion for a chair? And as I mentioned in my in my abstract, it's too challenging to talk about all the different possibilities around the world. But I think if we focus on one area then maybe we can get a sense of what this may look like. And I'm going to focus on uh, Latin America and specifically uh, Mexico. But I'll start with, you know, this chair. This is called the Butaque chair. And could the UN have used chairs from around the world like this Butaque chair? I mean, it's very, very beautiful, very elegant. Um, the Butaca, B-U-T-A-C-A, -A, is derived from a word from the Kumanogoto language of um, of Northern Venezuela region. And this language, the word putaca means chair. So the indigenous group that lived in the Caribbean coast of Venezuela um, had this name and it was adapted as, uh, as for, for references for use um, for other chairs. And the Cuban linguist Esteban Pichardo, for example, wrote um, in his dictionary of Cubanismos uh, that the Cuba butaca and chair were synonyms. And many use the variation butaque as well. So if you were to say in, in Cuba, um, does anyone have a butaca? They would understand that you mean, okay, I want to sit down somewhere, right? Um, so an early example uh, of this design of the butaca can be seen in the Venezuelan furniture maker, Sarafin Antonio Almeida. And he, this is the chair we're seeing now. And it was built around 1795. And it's currently on display at the Denver Art Museum. Um, and I recommend any of you who have the chance to go down there to, to take a look at this chair. It's, it's really quite stunning. And again, the joinery that's used to, to keep the chair together uh, and the armrests with kind of their extra wide um, um, you know, area so that people are more comfortable, the high back, um, it, it's, it's quite interesting. But there are other types of butaca chairs as well. And the person I want to focus on who really tried to do something with the design and who also was working in this modernist um, aesthetic of the early 20th century is a um, designer architect named um, uh, Clara Porcet. And Clara Porcet was born in Cuba in 1895. She uh, died in Mexico in 1980. And her goal, or part of her goal, was to create a chair that broke away from the common. You know, she wanted to create something that could be mass produced, but something that also spoke to the culture of the area, of the region. This was a very difficult task for her to achieve, by the way, uh, spoiler alert. So she did this by finding inspiration in Mesoamerican indigenous design. Um, more about that in a second, but first a little bit about Clara Porcet. She was born in 1895, as I mentioned, in Cuba into a wealthy family. Her father was the provisional governor of Matanzas, Cuba, which is about 60 miles east of Havana. In her teenage years, Porcet was able to study in New York at the Manhattanville Academy, which is run by the Convent of the Sacred Heart at the time. And then later she studied at Columbia's School of Fine Art and then the New York School of Interior Decoration. Her studies then continued in Paris, where she enrolled in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and the Sorbonne. She returned to Cuba in 1929 and 
she had a little bit of trouble in, in the country. She was twice obliged to leave due to her left-leaning political stances, which were in direct opposition to the pre-Castro pre governments. Now, during her time in exile, which included um, the United States as one of the places where she was exiled to, uh, she studied with a Bauhaus teacher named Joseph Albers at the Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And then in 1936, after being expelled again from Cuba, she moved to Mexico and she quickly adopted this country as her own. She loved Mexico. Uh, she met there um, an artist named Javier Guerrero. And this was a well-known muralist artist, but he also had studied carpentry um, in, during his life, which is kind of interesting. And she traveled the country with Guerrero, learning about the traditional styles of furniture making. And among these styles, the butaca or butaque chair was one that Porset wanted to popularize. So Porset's butaque chair incorporated a framing element that we'll notice in a second. And it was based on a statue from Totonacan culture that she found in a collection of Kurt uh, Stravenhagen. So here's the statue. As you can see, the Totonacan statue up in the upper right um, is a, a, a figure seated in, in a chair, uh, what looks like a chair, uh, four legs, and it has this X um, support in the back. Um, on the left-hand side of this image, you have a picture of Kurt Stavenhagen, who was a refugee from Nazi Germany living in Mexico. He was a jeweler by trade, and he invested much of his wealth into collecting pre-Columbian ceramic works of art. And he, by the time of his death, he had more than 3,000 really, really important pieces. So Clara Porset's Totonac chair was inspired by this fifth to seventh century sculpture held in the collection. And the sculpture shows a figure seated at the chair with the characteristic cross bracing design or X frame. And the Totonaca piece was made for the living room of a fellow architect. So there was a lot of thinking about design and about contemporary aesthetics that went into this, but it was interesting that it was based on this really, really early example of, of um, Mesoamerican um, pottery. So in developing this design as a butake or butaca chair, uh, Clara Porset sought to emphasize that she was what she referred to as, and this is her quote, the Mexican character of her furniture. Indeed, she considered these chairs to represent, and this is again her quote, the ultimate mestizo piece of furniture. And in using this term mestizo, um, Porset sought to draw attention to the pre-Columbian inspiration that was fully realized in her view when combined with influences from the cultural hybridization that characterizes Latin American art. So she was really going for something very unique, very special, and very geographically determined, but that still met all of the physiological requirements of, of any chair from anywhere in the world. So I'm going to kind of cut it off at this point and open it up for some conversations, but I have a few, uh, you know, closing questions to pose to the group before we enter this last piece. And, you know, chairs are fascinating. Um, at least in my opinion. <laughs> and they're also very complex social signifiers. So, and Clara Porset's Totonac chair, the butake, um, it speaks to this and it kind of captures a long historical continuity of craft and a consideration, you know, that anyone that works with wood is dealing with this same material and dealing with the same problems that come with, with, with joinery and with, and with cutting the wood to shape. Um, so taking, you know, this inspiration from a pre-Columbian model, Porset provides us with an example of what chairs could look like if design was opened up to all of these international influences locally uh, found. So thinking about how to make a chair allows us to ask this important question, and that is, you know, what does internationalism look like? What does a chair for the UN look like? Is it people from all over the world? sitting in similar chairs? Is it people from all over the world sitting in their own chairs? So this is what I'm asking this group to do now. You know, let's make a chair. And what type of chair would you design for the UN? And I'll end with that and open up for some Q&A, for some chat, and for any uh, 
comments you want to make about the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, one moment. I am. Okay, so I see wonderful. Okay, thank you, Peter. I appreciate that very much. Um, any any questions? Any any comments? Uh, any thoughts about what um, a chair might look like? I see one hand raised, but I'll have to beg the um, participants, uh, the hosts, uh, pardon for helping me uh, work this. I see Mohammed um, has a question. Uh, great, Mohammed, that uh, you're here. I'd love to hear your comments on this. I don't know if you can speak them, um, but maybe you could type them briefly. Well, I tell you what, um, I'm going to put my email into this chat. If any of you aren't able to pose questions now, uh, please reach out to me. And and I'm I'm sincere, although I'm, I'm I, I am shy, but I I would love to have uh, people looking in from time to time about what's going on in this uh, Instagram uh, space that I have. Uh, so if any of you have an interest in Instagram or want to see what other um, woodworkers around the world are doing. Um, it's a really, it's a really exciting group, a really fun group to talk to. All right, so um, could could one of the hosts help me with the questions? Yes, so there was a question from Peter Erickson. It states, uh, our culture in the US has become somewhat anti-chair. There's a lot of concern, especially among office workers that we're sitting too much. One occasionally finds headlines about how, how chairs are killing us. That's been a, uh, there's been a lot of experimentation with standing desks, sitting on exercise bowls, et cetera. What do you think this tells us about our relationships with chairs? Uh, have we been taking them for granted? Have we abused them? Yes, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, when, when you study this phenomenon of the Anthropocene, uh, which is kind of this post-industrial revolution period that we're living in supposedly now that's been dominated by uh, technology and comfort in many ways. Um, a lot of the theorists of the Anthropocene point to the chair as a symbol of, of the Anthropocene. Like everyone's sitting now. We're not, we're not walking as much. We're not doing uh, as, uh, as much movement as we did before. And, and honestly, the pandemic has only heightened uh, that reality. So the chair, yes, does have that. Um, and as much as the chair is an anchor to a location, um, it does have that potential. And there are many who focus in the world of uh, ergonomics and in, in the world of, um, uh, you know, should you stand, should you sit? Now, I know some people go so far as to have a standing desk with a, um, um, what do you call it, a, an elliptical underneath so they can walk as they're working. Um, I, you know, I've heard a little bit of both. If you stand all day, that could be a problem. Um, if you sit all day, that could be a problem. Um, but the chair very definitely is a symbol of the, of the particular age we're living in right now. And part of the question I'm trying to ask uh, with this idea of um, let's build a chair is and what should that chair look like? I mean, you could always build a chair that's that's like a barroom stool, right? And and that allows you to sit higher and and perhaps kind of find a middle place between sitting and standing. Or you could do very much like the um, Romans did when they uh, and the verb actually for to to dine in Latin is to recline at the table. Uh, the same verb is used for that type of experience. So they would they would recline laying back at the table um, when they had dinner. So I would love to be able to have a back and forth on this, Peter. I'm sure you have some nuances that I'm not even touching, but thank you for that question. And Mohammed, I believe you, uh, your mic is on if you'd like to ask a question. Mohammed, I can't hear you. If 
unfortunately, maybe some technical difficulties there. Please feel free to jump in once it starts working, Mohammed, or type your question in the chat. We'd be happy to get to it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I can see some of the chat questions. I don't know if there are other Q&A questions, but um, office chairs evolved. So office chairs have been plain, rigid, and stiff work chairs, and now they're more functional sources of support. Very true. Um, and that's one of the that's one of the questions um, that we. I guess I should point out in passing that I'm actually a, a department chair, <laughs> as well as someone interested in chairs, um, and I get requests all the time for new chairs. <laughs> People want to have a better um, chair in their office, and they want to have more comfort and more support, uh, and 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 that's. A, I mean, it's a request that we all should take seriously because it has to do with um, the ability to to work, but there's a lot of technology that goes into the chairs and a lot of thinking that goes into a chair. So um, it's, 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 it's very interesting. So do you have any pictures of a chair you have made? Um, so that, that, was, uh, that was something actually, I haven't made a chair yet. Um, I've gotten only to the, the, the back legs of a chair and that's where I am. I have two back legs of a chair ready to go. And I was just practicing making the angle. Um, you know, to make a back leg of a chair, you have to have at least a two by six piece of wood. And you use the, the left side of the wood to make the actual leg that's gonna to touch the bottom. And then you curve out at the top and start using the rest of the, of the, of the wood to make the, the seat back. So that's about as far as I've gotten now. And, uh, you know, we'll see, that's, that's one of my goals. <laughs> and thank you for, uh, for your comments about the talk. Mohammed, are you back on? Uh, what's the best type of wood for a chair? In general, the best type of wood is white oak. It's just really strong. It holds up really well in, in, in weather. And I should point out, you know, for chairs, you could make um, what they call green wood chairs, and that's one a little bit more common, you'll see those kind of like rocking chairs with the long spindle like um, supports in the back. And those are made out of green wood just cut with um, hand tools by most people. Um, and you can also, you know, use power tools. I should say I'm very much a power tool type of woodworker. I, I'm not, um, <laughs> I've only gotten hurt once so far knocking on wood, as they say, no pun intended. Uh, but it was with a hand tool. <laughs> so, so I have to be a little careful about that. But, you know, white oak is great. Mahogany is also a wonderful wood to use. Um, Brazilian rosewood used to be very, very uh, um, popular until it was actually banned because they were running out of Brazilian rosewood. Uh, so now anyone who has something in Brazilian road, rosewood actually has quite a valuable um, possession. Um, maple is, is, is another really, excuse me, not maple, um, Walnut is another great um, wood for this. I've, I've used walnut for tables, uh, but like I said, I haven't made a, a chair yet. Um, let's see here, Q&A. Oh, Mohammed, uh, the tabouret, the chef, as a social signifier, has a strong social and ideological connotations. Thank you for that. I, I really know very little about the, you know, the cultural contexts of all these chairs from around the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic that obviously fascinates me, so I'm learning a lot as I go, but I would love to talk to you about the um, uh, tabure du chef, and that we have the same word in Spanish, by the way, taburete. Um, so how do, how do chairs also symbolize power and entrenchment to it, especially in autocratic, undemocratic nations? Well, I mean, you know, the, the king has the throne, right? And everyone who recognizes a location, if you sit in uh, the head of the table. Um, and then, you know, on the total opposite side of this, uh, you know, you, you have some religions with this call to humbleness who'll say, you know, don't choose the head of the table to sit, choose the end of the table. That's, and then you're invited to the head, right? So, I mean, chairs have this huge symbolic value. And, you know, usually where you sit, when you can sit, you know, at some meetings, when someone stands up, everyone else has to stand up from their chair. Um, some people have to wait to sit before the first person is seated. So that's a great question, Mohammed. And there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, power dynamics going on around the seating and around chairs. I wonder, Peter in the chat asks, I wonder if you'd thought about disability and accessibility at all. 
as it relates to chairs. Uh, Sarah Hendren has a newish book about disability and access called What Can a Body Do? She argues that there is no such thing as a universal chair. The perfect chair is bespoke. Uh, it should be specifically designed for a particular individual, even if it means having to make them out of cardboard. Everybody needs has particular needs. I couldn't agree with this more, Peter. A, a chair, like a like a quality tailored suit, should fit the body, and you know, and it, and it usually doesn't. It's like buying a pair of shoes at at the you know at the um, at a shoe store. You you get what you get, and it will fit you. And maybe you can get a wide, or maybe you can get a narrow, but um, you know, you don't have much options there. Uh, but if you get like a actual uh, handcrafted bespoke uh, um, pair of shoes, you notice the difference right away. And the same thing with the chair. Um, you, it, so yes, the perfect chair has to be fit to the body. And there's actually pretty precise measurements. There's even a kind of a, a scale that um, I, I have to remember now the name of the company that did this, but you basically put in the the, the parameters like you know, 170 um, centimeters tall, uh, 70 kilograms, and then you you know you move the the wheels and it tells you what type of chair you should uh, design and for that particular person. Um, but one of my favorite chair designers is um, a guy named um, Malouf, M A L O O F. And um, he would basically hand carve and sculpt every one of his chairs to fit the person who was asking him to build it. And um, he used his own body as the place where he started to, 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 to gauge the chair. And he had a, apparently a very average body type. So he was able to get halfway there just on his own. But he took into consideration you know, the, the needs of the person. And then this other really important question you're asking is about accessibility and disability. And, you know, I, I haven't, but I will point out that I'm always uh, struck by um, the accessibility of some chairs that allow people to raise their seats or lower their seats, depending on the, the context of the conversation. Uh, of all places, I saw this once at a Sam's Club here in Fort Collins, where the greeter at the door had a very high um, um, chair, you know, very, a very high wheelchair. He was able to raise the chair or lower the chair, depending on uh, the people he was speaking with. And it, and it was interesting. It was, it was, it was significant. And, um, it, and to go back to Mohammed's point, there was a power dynamic there that that chair allowed the person to be a more active or a more equitable uh, participant in the conversation. So there, there's a lot there, and I'm not doing it justice. I just wanted to jump in here and say a huge thank you to Jonathan for this extremely fascinating presentation today. I know the whole time I was here listening, I was thinking about the chair in which I'm situated and all the contexts with that. Thank you to our audience for joining us this afternoon or this morning. Uh, if you do have time after this session, please complete the survey that will appear. Uh, we want to remind you that we have a full day of sessions again today, so please feel free to jump in and participate in our following sessions throughout the day. Uh, with special attention to our keynote at 1 p.m., Lulu Garcia Navarro from the New York Times. Again, a huge thank you to Jonathan and everyone in attendance, and I hope you have a wonderful day.